In this video, we're going to discuss what Christian generosity looks like. Now, one of the regular rhythms of being a Jesus follower is to give generously, to give regularly, to share what you have with others, especially those in need. We know that according to the Bible, it's an act of worship. We know that according to the Bible, it's one of the ways that we store up treasure in heaven, where moth and rust cannot destroy, where thieves cannot break in and steal. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but Jesus taught about finances more than anyone else in the entire Bible. In fact, taken together, 15% of Jesus' teachings were focused on money. That's more than his teachings on faith and prayer combined. And that's because we cannot divorce our faith from our finances. Our approach to money and possessions is a central part of our spiritual lives. That's why Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now I want to share with you three keys to living generously. Number one is to acknowledge God's ownership. The psalmist says it this way, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all those who dwell therein. First Chronicles 29 11 says this, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Passages like these teach one essential truth, and it's this. God owns everything. He owns everything on this earth. He owns everything in the universe. He owns everything in your life. He owns everything in my life. And because of this, what we're encouraged to, to think like, in, according to the Bible, is to think like stewards. Thinking like a steward is acknowledging that as the creator and sustainer of the world, God owns it all. My life is God's, my resources are God's, my time is God's. And so if God owns everything, then everything that I have is a gracious gift from him that is meant to be used for his glory and for my good and for the good of those around me. Now, one of the cool things about God is that he's a generous God. Okay, we, we talk about generosity as Christians because we know that God himself is generous. God gave his only son. Jesus gave his life. The Holy Spirit gives us everything we need for life and for godliness. That's because God is a giver. He delights in giving us awesome stuff. Now, this shouldn't surprise us. If you're a parent or an aunt or an uncle or an older sibling then you know what it's like to, to have joy in giving to, to others. There's, there's joy in, in providing for a child or giving a gift or being generous with those that you love. And the reason you enjoy giving is because God enjoys giving. God is generous. And, and so when we are generous, we are like God in that moment. God's a good father who delights in blessing his children with wonderful things, but there's also a caveat here, and it's this. God expects us to use our gifts well. Okay, each of us have received talents, opportunities, resources, time. The question is, are we using our resources for the glory of God, or are we squandering them? This is where biblical stewardship comes in. A steward is somebody who manages another person's resources. They're allowed to do whatever they want with those resources, but one day they will be held accountable to the owner for how they spent those resources. We get this actually from a Greek term. It's this term oikonomos. It's actually where we get the word economics. Oikonomos is made of two Greek terms. The first is oikos, which means house household. The other is the verb nemo, which means to manage something. So oikonomos is a household manager. And so when we think about life and our resources and our, what we have, our stuff, this is exactly how we are viewed, are called to view our resources. We are managers, not owners. And so a simple way to think about stewardship, biblical generosity, is to ask this question. If Jesus had your resources, how would he use them? Okay, how would Jesus leverage your home for ministry? 
What about your job? How would he use that? Or your car? Or your dinner table? Or your backyard? Or your pool? Or your finances? Or your passions? Your time? Your natural abilities and talents? If Jesus had your life, how would he leverage your life for ministry. So key number one is to to acknowledge that God owns it all. Key number two is if you want to be generous, you have to learn to master your money. In order to give more, in order to be generous and to to worry less in life and to, to trust God to provide, you're going to have to learn how to master your finances instead of allowing your finances to master you. Jesus teaches on this very topic. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 6, 24, some famous words. He says, nobody can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. You see, the the Bible's main concern with money is this. Does money control you or do you control Now, I know that for some of us, money is kind of a taboo topic, but you need to to know today that it's it's actually quite neutral, okay? Money money isn't good, money isn't bad, it's it's just a resource that is out there, but the, the question is, is that resource something that we use well, or is that resource something that uses us? You see, money is a wonderful servant, but it could be also be a very terrible master, We don't need to be afraid of making money. Okay, make as much money as you want. Make as much money as you can. But just remember that, according to Paul, 1 Timothy 6.10, it's the love of money that is the root of all kinds of evil. So, So money isn't bad, but being controlled by it, loving it, worshiping it, exalting it too high is bad, and it will pierce you with many pangs. Let me share with you some quotes from some of the wealthiest people in history. William Vanderbilt said, the care of $200 million is enough to kill anyone. There's no pleasure in it. John D. Rockefeller said, I have made many millions in my life, but they have brought me no happiness. Andrew Carnegie said, millionaires seldom smile. John Jacob Astor said, I'm the most miserable man on earth. And Henry Ford said, I was happier when doing a mechanic's job. So the question is, are you generous, number one? But number two is, 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 is your financial situation, are you controlled by your finances or are you in control? Are you using your finances as a tool or are your finances using you? Well, the best way to answer that question is to follow the numbers. If someone was given permission to follow your finances, what would they discover about you? What would they learn about what you value, where you find your security, how you view success? How much money do you waste each week? Do you live within your means? Do you save? Do you share your things? Do you give generously? Do you take care of your credit? Do do you use your resources well or do you squander them? Because the way you use your money reveals a lot about you. Mature disciples understand that money is a tool for ministry. Yes, it's a necessity of life. Yes, it's a wonderful resource. But just like every resource, God intends to leverage it for the kingdom of heaven. A simple plan that we like to teach here at South Valley is something we call 10-10-80, which is to, to save 10%, to give 10%, and to live on the 80% with minimal debt. That's, that's a, a, a simple plan for financial freedom and, and security, 10-10-80. So we'd encourage you to wrestle with that because without a plan, you will never have a generous spirit. That's why Proverbs says in 20, Proverbs 21, 5, good planning and hard work lead to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. Without a plan for your finances, your finances will control you rather than you controlling them. Well, the last key I want to share with you to generosity is to trust God's provision. Acknowledge that it all belongs to him. Choose to master your money instead of allowing it to master you. 
And, and as you give generously, as you, as you give to support the efforts of your church home, South, South Valley Community Church, we are grateful for your generosity, for your, uh, your, your, your generous giving to support the ministry we do in this building and, and in this community and, and around the globe and, and throughout California and out throughout the United States. It's because of your generosity that we get to do the things that we do. And as you give generously, I would just encourage you to trust God's provision. That's why Jesus says these words. After he talks about giving, he talks about anxiety, knowing that, you know, sometimes we wonder, will we be taken care of? And God promises we will. Matthew 6, 25. He says, that's why I tell you not to worry about your everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he'll give you everything that you need. So don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. God promises to take care of you. And what that means is when it comes to your stuff, instead of living like this with clenched fists, you can embody generosity like your heavenly father is generous and you can open up your hands to help others, to be generous, to give regularly to the mission of God for the, the, the expansion of his kingdom on earth. So I wanna give you three ways that you could get started in this. Number one is to make a covenant to give. Uh, I didn't start giving until I actually made a covenant with myself that I was going to commit to being generous. I was 17 years old. I had a full-time job. I, I wanted to learn how to be generous, and, and I remember hearing a sermon on it, and it was, it was right then and there that I said, you know what? I'm not going to hoard all my stuff. I'm going to begin to live as if a fraction of what I have is, is it's already, it's not even mine to use. It's, it's to give away. And so I, I committed to that when I was 17 years old and I've never looked back. Make a covenant, a promise with yourself to be generous. Number two, sign up for recurring donations. Uh, one of the best ways, if you want to be consistent as a giver, is to determine an amount that you want to give and sign up for that amount and, and, and just stick with it month after month after month. That's how my, me and my wife do it. It's how we've done it for years and years and years and years. And uh, it's, it's a, a simple way of saying, you know what? I'm going to commit regularly this portion of what I bring in. I'm going to commit that to the Lord. And I'm going to live as if that's already being used for his kingdom. And finally, number two, tr or three, trust God with your future. God says he will provide. So take him at his word. You don't need to worry. Worry is a thief. Worry steals time, steals brain power, steals joy. There, there are many things that will rob you of joy in life, things like the regrets of yesterday and especially worries about tomorrow. God promises to be a good father. He's given you everything that you need for life and godliness. He hasn't even spared his one and only son. Jesus didn't spare his own life. He became he became poor for us that we might be made rich in him. So trust him even with your finances. Let's be generous.